And I was born in California. I'm one of those odd people who was born in the Golden State and then came east instead of everyone else going out to the Golden State. When I came to New York after college, I was really naive. I was just painfully naive. A college professor of mine had written to Time Magazine. He knew he was my chemistry professor, but he knew I did not want to go on and be a medical student, which was what I had majored in. I was a pre-med. And he wrote to Time Magazine and said, have you got any jobs for people just out of college? And they wrote back and said they had this training program, but that they interviewed in the spring and they wouldn't advise me to come back because it was very competitive. So I went to San Francisco to look for a job in journalism, which is what I wanted and had no success at all and realized I did not want to go and just repeat my college life with my college friends. So I came back to New York on the basis of this correspondence with Time Magazine and I had all my letters of recommendation written to Time Magazine. And um, I got interviewed. I got in for an interview. I got in for several interviews. And finally the woman said to me, what are you going to do if you don't get this job? And I said, I don't have the faintest idea. So they hired me, and she told me later that they worried that I would end up out on the street if they didn't hire me. So I worked for Time Magazine for seven years. Then I got married, had two kids. And when the kids were at the state of beginning to grow up, I said, I, I ended up getting a job with a man with whom I wrote a book. And... Um, that was the second book. The first book I had written with someone and my name wasn't even on the cover. So the second book, my name was on the cover and I finally said, I'm not doing this anymore. The only way I can write books without working for someone is to have some kind of degree. So I went back to school and I went back to school in the field of nutrition at Columbia University Teachers College and took a doctorate degree. And two days after my oral, I was department chair, which is not a recommended career move under any circumstances, but it was actually life-saving because for the nutrition profession, I was grown up when I went back to school and I was very interested in environmental issues. And the nu nutrition at the time, nutrition had absolutely nothing to do with the environment, nothing. And so I, in effect, invented a field called nutritional ecology. I still teach the course, named that, after 40-some years. And, uh, and I ended up creating this field, which is now all around us in the form of farmers markets, local food, the whole, the whole, all those ideas, the connection with energy, all those ideas were things that I was fooling around with 35, 40 years ago. I taught for a number of years and chaired the department for 10 years, went on teaching quite a while and wrote two books. The first one was called The Feeding Web, which was about everything I was teaching about limits to growth, food and population, the food supply, advertising, energy and food. And the essays, I hesitate to say, could be published today. They're not out of date, I'm sorry to say. And then I subsequently wrote a book called Chicken Little Tomato Sauce in Agriculture, which was about the contest between biotechnology and non-biotechnology and how we would rescue the food supply since people didn't even know what was in their food now. The country at the time was, I mean, we did have our first environmental movement. Rachel Carson and had, had, had come out with her Silent Spring. There was a kind of surge of interest in what we were doing with pesticides. It, was, it did not touch my profession, the nutrition profession. It simply wasn't. And there were, book, there were a series of books, interestingly enough, in the early 70s, there were a series of books about the American food supply. Jim Hightower wrote a book called Hard Tomatoes, Hard Times. There was a book called Mom's Apple Pie. There were, there was, there were just a, 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 a maybe seven or eight books about the problems in the American food supply. They were written by non-nutritionists and they were considered by the academic world, you know, they were like dismissed. It was like, that, well, those, are, those people aren't academics so they don't know anything. And the nutrition profession was really very, I remember looking in a textbook when I got so interested in energy and how energy got into food and how we were spending 10 calories of fossil fuel energy to get one calorie food, I got so interested, I went and looked at a textbook to see what it said about energy, and it had one picture of a leaf and the, so and the sunlight and CO2, and it said photosynthesis, and that was it. That was all you were going to learn.
I've thought a lot about how how things might turn around and why they have begun to turn around because they have we have a food movement now we actually have something we can call a good food movement it's small I think the movement began to be laid in the 70s with the first energy crisis it was wiped out by Reagan it's been oozingly slow <laughs> it has not raced to any kind of conclusion but I think I think energy is one piece of it, and I, th and I think will be more. I think energy is going to push it more because when, when peak oil really hits, once we come out of this recession and we, and we hit the peak again and get knocked back down again, I think we're going to realize that we can't afford, we don't have cheap fuel anymore, and we can't ship food all over that way, we, and we shouldn't be doing it. I do not know how to explain all the young people who are interested in farming. That's the touching part to me, that there is a whole group of young people who are wanting to use their hands. I, I like to think that it's, it's a reaction to this electronic world we live in and that the lack of, when you sit all day at a computer moving nothing but your fingers, that the idea of being in touch with something real is very appealing to people. I was on the National Organic Standards Board for longer than I like to think about, and it was very hard work. I got on there after they'd already succumbed to letting synthetics into processing, even though the law said you couldn't have any synthetics in processing, and I spent much of my time there trying to force their hand, trying to get them to see that they couldn't do that, and trying to get them to say that they had no basis for approving anything because there were no, in the law, the law sets standards, the law allows certain non-synthetics in production and then sets very strict standards for how you judge them. And the first day I went to a meeting of the National Organic Standards Board, we were being presented with a bunch of materials and we were given these standards and they were food additives. And the standards didn't apply, like how does this fit into an organic system? And then I went back and I read the law and I finally figured it all out. I said, well, at least we should set up a series of standards. If we're gonna let these things be in there, we ought to have standards for food additives to be let in. We got it done. It probably only took two years. We got it done, but they couldn't put it in the regs. They put it in the prologue to the regs. They couldn't put it in the regs because it was illegal. And when there was constant pressure from industry, constant pressure. Horizon, the guy from Horizon came and said to us, don't be premature, don't put in this rule, don't require cattle to be on pasture all that time. You know, all these pressures were put on us to ease up on the rules. The animal raising rules are helpful and probably getting better now that they're enforcing them. And I think the crop raising rules are okay. I think what happens is the worst that's things that ha have happened are what happens when you start processing those foods. And there I think it's really lost its way. I was in a debate at the meeting of the Northeast Organic Farming Association on local versus organic. And I took the side of local, which is not easy if you're at an organic farming association. And I said that the reason is you could always convert a local farmer to organic, but that with, with organic, you had no control at all. I mean, it might be coming from Chile, and, 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 it, and it does, you know? And, and I'm not even sure those, I'm not even sure how I feel about those standards that are applied in, that, in those circumstances, but I certainly know how I feel about the, you know, the air miles that it's logged getting here and what it tastes like to have asparagus fresh, quote, from Chile in the Northeast. So I'm absolutely convinced that we have to bend the standards toward local and keep local from being co-opted because boy, are they good at co-optation. I mean, they're really good at it. I have a dear friend, the person I teach with, who's busy trying to work with large school districts to improve their purchasing practices. Now, it's not all gonna be organic and local, but the goal is just to raise the standards. And it tends to be that if you're gonna get really good chicken nuggets that aren't floor scrapings, as she puts it, you know, that probably it's a local producer you're gonna get it from. So. There's a, there's a lot of movement on a lot of fronts to make things better. I must say I find the ordinary supermarket deeply, deeply depressing. The number of things there, the number of unnecessary things, the, the driving of the juice out of the juice aisle by everything else, the driving of actual cereal out of the cereal aisle is very, very depressing. 
I think it'll take some pretty shocking stuff that's to, to really move the bulk of the people who grew up thinking that what was in the supermarket was food. We have an epidemic of disease in this country, of degenerative disease. I mean, the obesity level is horrendous. Overweight just under that, a larger number, but the, the weight is just lower and headed for obesity. We have, we have diabetes in, in children, type two diabetes in children, which used to be thought of as adult onset diabetes. We really are in it, we're really in a terrible mess. And, and, and that's, that's the other thing that may really be driving some change. I think people are deeply upset when they're finally brought to realize that it's what they're feeding their kids that's doing it to them, that I think people are getting more and more upset and want, want something better.